We should uh, we could sidestep for a moment and look at one other way to calculate the correlation, as it uh, can be insightful in its own way. Because another method that you could employ is to uh, is to calculate z scores for every individual in advance. It's the, it gives you the exact same result, but basically we divide by the standard deviations, which was normally the last step of computing the correlation coefficient. We now do this a lot earlier. We, do, we start doing it for every individual participant already. If you calculate a correlation manually, then you might realize, oh, but that's actually more work, right? Uh, nonetheless, it can be informative, can be educational to uh, study this method. There's a number of things to be said about what the z-score actually is. There, uh, yeah, there is maybe time for that in a future video series, who knows? But can somebody quickly recap what a z-score is supposed to express? What does this z-score of the first cook express? Minus 1.25. Yes, go ahead. Um, it shows the amount of standard deviations that the observation is based on the mean. Yes, a z-score expresses how many standard deviations a score is away from the mean. Indeed. What we see is that uh, the first cook had one single musician to listen to during their work shift. That's uh, a bit less than the average. Well, we, that's actually the first thing we do when we compute the z-score. We see how far away the score is from the mean. 1 minus 5. Looks like we are 4 below the mean. Uh, 4 musicians below the mean. And then we compare this to the standard deviation. So that we can say how many standard deviations is that? If you are 4 away from the mean. Is that a lot? Is that a little? So we, we compare it to how much the usual cook would be away from the mean, in a sense. Turns out that an individual like this would be 1.25 standard deviations below the average on the musician's variable. This can get tedious rather quickly now, then, because we have to compute such a z-score for every single individual in the data set. Uh, imagine you collect a realistic sample, like, yeah, let's sample 300 participants. We're not going to do it manually then. You want to rely on a computer in such a scenario. But yeah, I mean, the basic principle is this way. Calculate the z-score for every individual. And uh, then what you can do is you can again make a cross product. Now you can now uh, make a cross product, a standardized cross product, we could uh, call it on the basis of the z-scores. The z-score then immediately expresses how far, uh, whether a person is above or below the mean, so that is in its own way useful. Huh? You can immediately say from the z-score, ah, so participant 1 scored below the mean on the musician's variable, negative z-score, and they also scored below the mean on the order's variable, another negative z-score. Multiply those by one another, and you have yourself a positive cross product. So just like before, this cook will make the correlation more positive. And similarly, we will have other individuals with a positive cross product and some with, right, uh, one actually with uh, a zero cross product. This already points toward the fact that this method should yield the same result, right? Yeah, so, and what is the correlation then? The correlation is then nothing else than the average of those cross products. They are already standardized. You already base them on z-scores. So the only thing you have to do is average the standardized cross products out. Like this. So you add up the cross products on the basis of the z-scores. You divide them by the total sample size. Minus 1. Again, the small correction. And look at that. The result is again 0 0.61.
Hey there, this is Vincenzo speaking. If this video helped you, be sure to check out our book series called Pirate Speeches and P-Values. Link is in the description down below. And if you study in Maastricht, the Netherlands, consider joining one of our crash courses in statistics. I hope to see you there. Thanks for watching.